We're going to read from 1 Chronicles chapter 17. David is settled in his palace. Things seem to be going quite well. And uh, we pick up the story when he says, After David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here am I, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Nathan replied to David, Whatever you have in mind, do it, for God is with you. But that night the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. You are not the one to build me a house to dwell in. I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought Israel up out of Egypt till this day. I have moved from one tent site to another, from one dwelling place to another. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their leaders, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. And have done since the time I appointed leaders over my people. I will also subdue all your enemies. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me. And I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then David went in and sat before the Lord And he said, Who am I, Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if there were not enough in your sight, my God, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant. You, Lord God, have looked on me as though I were the most exalted of men. What more can David say to you for honouring your servant? For you know your servant. Lord, for the sake of your servant and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made known all these great promises. There is no one like you, Lord. No God but you, as we've heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whose God went out to redeem a people for himself and to make a name for yourself and to perform great and also wonders by driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. You made your people Israel your very own forever and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord, let the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house be established forever. Do as you promised so that it will be established and that your name will be great forever. Then people will say, The Lord Almighty, the God over Israel, is Israel's God, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. You, my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build a house for him, so your servant has found courage to pray to you. You, Lord, are God. You have promised these good things to your servant. Now you've been pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, Lord, have blessed it, and it will be blessed forever. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. John Newton went to uh, Oney as a curate. In those days, if you got the living of a, of a place, of, of, a, of, a, of a church, um, you could go and you could work there 
or you could live elsewhere and employ someone to run it for you. In those days, priests got the equivalent of something of between 120 and 140,000 pounds a year. So you could afford to pay someone else to do it. And that's what the vicar of Oney did. He never really came to Oney. He just put John Newton in charge. Well done for the people of Oney, at least. He wrote many hymns. He uh, transformed the church in a, in a, a town that had about 5, 000, sorry, 2,000 people in it. Um, over 2,000 used to come to church on a Sunday morning. They had to build a gallery to hear him speak God's word. He wrote many hymns. Some of them are well-known and some of them are best forgotten. Um, this is one of the in-betweens I'm going to read to you. Oppressed with unbelief and sin, fighting without and fears within, while earth and hell with force combined assault and terrify my mind. What strength have I against such foes, such hosts and legions to oppose? Alas, I tremble, faint and fall. Lord, save me, or I give up all. Thus sorely pressed, I sought the Lord to give me some quaint, sweet cheering word. Again I sought, and yet again I waited long, but not in vain. Oh, it was a cheering word indeed, exactly suited to my need. Sufficient for thee is my grace, thy weakness my great power displays. Now despond and mourn no more. I welcome all I feared before. Though weak, I'm strong. Though troubled, blessed. For Christ's own power shall on me rest. My grace would soon exhausted be, but this is boundless as the sea. Then let me boast with holy Paul that I am nothing. Christ is all. I am nothing. Christ is all. Now, through the years, people have asked of the secrets of the success of people like Newton. Well, I think the secrets are found in that last line of that hymn, one that we probably will never sing. That I am nothing. Christ is all. And so it was with David, this man that Newton preached about 250 years ago today. David had got through his troubled times, the times when he'd sent someone off to war so that he might die and David might marry his widow. The problems with family, the problems with enemies, and all was going well. And he longed to do something for God. And he felt guilty that he was living in a palace while God's Ark of the Covenant lived in a tent and he thought, I've got to build a place for him. I've got to build a building, a magnificent building. And he asks Nathan the prophet, who carelessly says, I'll do whatever you like. <laughs> God's with you. Do what you want. Until God comes and speaks to Nathan. And God says, when did I ask for a building? When did I ask for a, a, a temple made of cedar. Now, cedar was an expensive wood. Looked magnificent. Came from Lebanon, a bit up the coast, mostly. And God says, when did I ever ask for that? You know, there are times when as Christians we want to do something for God, but we do the wrong thing. We think to ourselves, oh, God will want this, or God will want that, or it would be nice to do this for him. And actually, it's not what God calls us to do at all. And so God had to speak to Nathan and say, nope, I don't want David to do it. Now, he didn't tell him there and then why, but he tells him later on in, in the book of Chronicles that it's because David was a warrior and he, he want, didn't want a warrior building his temple. He wanted a man of peace, his son Solomon. But he says, nope, I don't want you to do that. Do we listen to God? 
Do we live according to what God has said? Or what we think he might like? Now there's an excuse for us. In those days before we come to faith in him and before we understand who he is, before we discover his word, I hear people talking about people who live live a Christian way of life, whatever that is. What people normally mean by that is they're quite a nice person, really, at least in public. They do nice things, they're kind to people. And perhaps the people looking at them and perhaps the people doing it think, oh, God will like me better if I do this or I do that. Just as well for their peace of mind that there isn't a prophet Nathan to go, don't be so silly. Except there are those who can say, don't be so silly. And that's you and I, if we put our trust in God. There is a thought around in the world outside, mainly by those who think that somehow this is a Christian country. It's a concept that's not found in the Bible at all, and um, I don't believe in it at all. Those who think it's a Christian country, that if you just obey the Ten Commandments, do the best you can, so do, you know, be nice to people generally, uh, then you'll, you'll, you're in with God. The truth couldn't be further from that. Because you see, we're all sinners. We're all people who get things wrong. And the only way to be in with God is to come to him and find forgiveness for those things that we've done wrong because actually God loves us anyway. And he waits to accept us. But there is no excuse, really, when we have come to faith in Christ, when we've come to follow him, when we make important in our lives and try and make important in the lives of others those things that God has not called us to do. And those things that God has not called us to be. And I suppose the most important example of that is church buildings, because this is just a building. You'll have heard me say it before. This is just a building. It is not holy. It is not sacred in any way. It's just the place where the church meets. Now, I don't want you tearing it up. I'll get in trouble for that, if you do that. I don't want you mucking about with it, breaking the windows and doing all the sorts of horrible things. But it's just a building. That's all it is. It's just a tool that we use for the worship of God and to meet together to, to extend his kingdom. Does God want buildings full of gold and silver and great art and great ornaments and uh, wonderful things to look at? Well, from this passage, no. God's never asked for that. He let Solomon build a temple. But he didn't ask for it. It wasn't in his plan. But he let them do it anyway. And he lets us have buildings. And he lets us have our foibles about them. Oh, you can't do that in a church. You can't do that in a church. But I don't honestly believe God cares a bit about that. What has God told us? Has he said, build me buildings, put them in the center of the town, put a cross on the top so that everyone will know that I am God? Well, that hasn't worked out too well, has it? I come, used to live in Norfolk, and quite literally, in parts of Norfolk, you can stand in the doorway of one church and hit the church next door with a stone. It's a stone's throw away. You can stand in other places at the door of a church and you can see six other churches across that flat, barren landscape of Norfolk. Has it made it any more Christian? No, not at all. So what has God said? Well, he says, repent of your sins. Believe in my son, Jesus Christ. Be baptized. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Tell out the good news. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Set the prisoner free. Declare God's favor. I think that's enough to be getting on with just for now, don't you? I think when we come to the point where we can say 
that we've truly repented of our sins, that we've been baptized, that we're seeking to spread the good news, that we are loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, I think then, when we're convinced that we're doing all that, then is the time perhaps to worry about some other things. Until then, let's just do what God tells us to do. Well, I'm sure he was disappointed, but David doesn't show disappointment. Because God has something else to say. He says, you want to build me a house, I'm going to build you one. (laughs) I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a family that will be there forever. And he wasn't just talking about Solomon. He was talking about the one who would come. He was talking about the one that Simeon was talking about. Jesus, son of David, King David, his great ancestor. He says, thank you very very much, David, but no thanks. And he gives him this great promise. He says, you want to bless me with a building, I'm going to bless you with something that you don't even understand as I talk to you about it. It's so amazing. Someone has said, Morgan, one of the commentators, Our relationship with God is always based on what he does for us, never upon what we do for him. If he wills that we build a temple, it's ours to do, but the doing of it creates no merit by which we may claim anything for him. He says it's all about what God does for us. Oh, our hearts tell us different. Our hearts tell us, well, I've done this for God and I've done that for God. And and if I only do that for God, then perhaps he'll be more pleased with me. And, And for years I've served him. He must like me better now. No. Because it's all about what he does for us. David accepted God's no very graciously. Because when he heard what God wanted to do for him, he was overwhelmed. And all thoughts of having to build a temple and all thoughts of it becoming David's temple, because in later years it was known as Solomon's temple, were gone when he heard what God wanted to do for him. Spurgeon um, gives a warning in this, though. He says, there are some who profess faith who would do a great thing, who would do a great thing for God if they might but if they're not permitted an act to act a shining part in it, they're in the sulks and angry with their God. David, when his proposal was set aside, found in his heart not to murmur, but to pray. I don't know if you've ever been to one of the great cathedrals in the land. One of the things you see in them are plaques everywhere often beginning to the glory of God and in memory of. But actually, they've been given by someone's family or those who admired them, and it talks about how great they were and what wonderful things they did and how they gave towards this great cathedral that was built to the glory of God. And I love cathedrals. They're amazing, amazing buildings. But you know what? Most of the time, not only were they built to the glory of God, but to the glory of those who built them. And David probably wanted some of the glory, but when God said no, he was happy enough. He said, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Because you're going to build my house, and that's a greater promise. Oh, sometimes we want something, quite literally, concrete, made of bricks, to show how good God has been. But you know, how good God has been is what goes on in here and in here, and how he changes our lives. So what does he say, this great King David? He's, he says, who am I that you have brought me this far? So this is King David. This is King David who had been brought from a shepherding to, to rule over the people of Israel, who'd won great battles, who'd survived his predecessor trying to kill him. And he says, who am I? I'm nothing. There is no one like you. You've made a people of us. There is no one like you. Oh, that we could grasp the reality of that. Oh, that when God blesses us, we could honestly 
go. Who am I to deserve all this for I don't? And not only say it, but act it out. You know what's wrong? Well, it's only my opinion. But you know what I think is wrong with the church and its influence in our land? It's not that we don't have enough MPs on our side. It's not that we don't have enough celebrities um, spreading the news through TikTok or Instagram or whatever else is being used these days. It's not that we don't have enough people with, with great persuasive skills to preach in all the great arenas of the land and to bring people to faith in Christ. It's often that when people look at the church and meet people from the church, instead of saying, well, who am I? And pointing to God and his glory, it's more, look at me, how wonderful I am. Oh, we don't always say it, but sometimes we act like we're God's gift to the world. The only gift to the world is the one who was sent to live among us and to die for us and to rise to new life. Who am I? What a wonderful attitude to have. Thank you, God. Instead, so often, we act like the people of Israel as God had taken them out of Egypt and brought them into the desert and was taking them through the desert to the promised land. And they even began to say, oh, when we were in Egypt, it was so nice. We had fresh herbs and fresh vegetables to eat. Do you remember the days, the days of slavery? Slavery is not that bad, you know. They kind of said to themselves, at least we had something to eat and God had rescued them. Do you ever find yourself doing that? Do you ever find yourself complaining about your lot in life? Complaining about all the people around you who just don't get you, and just don't understand you? Do you ever find yourself complaining about church? Forgetting that you and I are church. And forgetting that when we complain about church, we complain about the one who brought us to be part of this church. Not David. David's attitude wasn't, I am so great, even God gives me gifts. His attitude was, God is so good, he even gives me gifts. You want to do something for God? Check it's the sort of thing he wants you to do. Take his promises on board. His promise of forgiveness. His promise of new life. His promise that he loves you in spite of who you are, in spite of who I am. And when God blesses you in this new year of 2023, when God blesses you, see it for what it is. See that you deserve none of it. You know what? I don't deserve to stand here. And listen very carefully when I say to this, don't take it too seriously. I don't deserve to be paid to do this job. I don't. I don't deserve for people to listen when I speak. I don't deserve for people to pay attention. Because I'm a sinner. I have failed God time and time and time and time again. And you know what he does? He picks me up. He sets me off again. And it's very often in the very direction I didn't want to go in the first place. But when I go, he blesses me. And sometimes I see the wonder in that he blesses others. Will you join me on the journey in 2023? Will you join me in doing what God wants you to do? In his way, in his time. Having patience to wait for him to put things right and to set things right. And when he does, will you honestly say, rather than saying, oh, say, who am I that God wants to bless me? 
and the world out there will take notice of the church that you are part of once more. Amen.